your heart in worship. You can put that cup of coffee down or you can stand up with that cup of coffee. Just engage your heart this morning. Welcome to Journey Church Online. Who brings the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, sing this out. Who shakes? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Come on, see it out. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my you done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and Justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of Glory, the King of all kings. Come on, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place. That you would. have your way, God. Won't you have your way, Lord? I love you, Lord. Oh, 
your mercy never fails all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God come on sing this out all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you led me through the fire in darkest nights. You were close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Come on, sing this out wherever you are. Oh, my life. If you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath, with every breath that I am being Oh, I will see all the goodness This is running after, it's running after me. Yes, it is, God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Running out, oh, yes, it is. Your goodness is running out, it's running out. Come on and hurry. Put my life lay down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out.
don't you just lift your hands to the Lord this morning, wherever you are, sing to the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. He is for you, he is for you, he is for you. 
constant. He is Father. He says, I am Abba. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Church, hear me this morning. As we prepare next week to be in this building, we've said it since week one. Worship has never been canceled. It's come home. This morning, right where you are, you have an opportunity to experience the power of the Holy Spirit right where you are. His promises are yes and amen. So right where you are, I'm going to encourage you. If you want an infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you want just an outpouring of God, if you need a breakthrough this morning, right now, right where you are, just lift your hands to the Lord. If you're in your car and maybe you're hearing this on a podcast, maybe this is a year from now and you're watching this service. He's the author of time. Just reach out your, stretch out your arms. Receive his blessing. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. sees your tears even in that quiet place he is with you he is for you he loves you he loves his children and I encourage you Trust him. Love on him. Because he is God. God bless you. Hey, Jerry Church family. I'm excited to get to come to you because this means we are one step closer to opening the building and being able to worship with you guys live in person. Now, we know there's a whole lot of upheaval, a lot of uncertainty. What does this look like? How do we do this? And I even realized some of you are not super comfortable getting out yet. We want you to know we love you. We bless you. Stay engaged online. And when you're comfortable, join us. For those of you that aren't going to join us, let me talk you through what that's going to look like. You may be trying to figure some of this stuff out. And instead of you show or verbalizing it, we thought we'd show you. So come along on a ride with me. As you pull into the parking lot, You'll see a member of our team, probably Pastor Sterling, the mask and gloves and a sign just telling you we're excited to have you with us in service. We're going to ask that when you get out of your car, make your way straight on into the building and not necessarily congregate, but come on in, let's get you situated and we'll be ready to go. Once you come in, you'll be then brought over to our welcome desk. If you've not registered for service ahead of time, you'll have the opportunity to register. That way we can keep track of some different information that we need. If you have registered, then you'll be taken on any national news. Once you've checked in, you'll come to the door at the worship center where you'll be asked to use hand sanitizer, make sure your hands are clean for everybody in your family, and then you'll be greeted by a member of our team. Hey, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. It's so good to see you. I have a seat just for you if you want to follow me this way. And I'm going to ask you to sit right here and service will begin shortly. Thank you. As you can tell by looking around in the room, 
Our chairs are set up differently. We're set up in a way to where we can accommodate families and keep the strict physical distancing of six feet in all directions. With that said, we're following a lot of the governor's guidelines and requests as far as keeping other chairs and other things apart. So all of that is to say this, we're gonna ask you to be okay with where we ask you to sit. I know you would like to, maybe you normally sit in the back, you normally sit here, you normally sit there. We're gonna ask you for the next couple of weeks, it's, it's different, there's not much we can do about that, but we're gonna ask you to just sit where we ask you to sit for the next couple of weeks. I know it's tough, but we can do this together. Now, once, the, once you're seated, we're going to ask you to, to, to go ahead, take your seats, and then if you have to go to the restroom, you're going to come out the other door, the rest of the door is closest to the restroom, you'll go in there. Now, a member of our team will be outside the doors because of the governor's requests. We can't let more than two people at a time be in the bathrooms. So a member of our team will be there, and they're going to kind of keep an eye on that. At the conclusion of service, we're going to ask you to stay seated. You'll be dismissed by Rose. Uh, to go on out. That way our team can start sanitizing chairs for the next service, uh, our team can start cleaning the bathrooms, all the touch surfaces, getting all of that ready to go. You'll be dismissed out the opposite door you came in, you'll be able to go out the opposite door that you came in, you'll be out in the parking lot. At that point in time, if you want to connect with other people, we're going to ask you to keep a six foot physical distance, but you could do so out there. This unfortunately has to be a touch-free environment right now. We can't shake hands, we can't hugs, we can't do that. You want an elbow, you do something like that, you could do that, but unfortunately we're going to have to kind of keep it at about that level for the next few weeks. So we're super excited and I want you to understand that your physical, your mental, your emotional, and your spiritual health are all of the most importance to us. So some of you may see this and think, wow, this is overkill. Some of you may think, man, you really should be doing more. We're doing our best to follow the guidelines that are coming from the governor. If we want to create the most best environment, the most best, you like that, the best environment we can for you to be safe and healthy and worship the King. Masks are not required. They are highly recommended. But if we can't require that, we're not going to. But we want to encourage you to come. Let's connect because we really truly believe that this is going to be a safe, uh, a nice sanitary, and a spectacular Sunday. Come out and join us. We look forward to it. God bless you. You know, watching that video earlier this week it just gets me excited because one week from today, I get to see a lot of your smiling faces right in this place. I realize some of you are not going to be real comfortable yet, and we understand that. We love you. We bless you. Don't wait too long, but we'll be, there'll be a place here for you. You saw a lot of what we're going to do because your physical, your mental, your spiritual, and your uh, emotional health are all super important to us. So we're taking a lot of steps. We're doing a lot of things to get prepared. Some of you will watch that and think, man, that is overkill. And some of you will watch that and think that's not enough. We're going to do our best because we want to create a place where you're safe. It's really clean. It's ready to go. And it'll be spectacular. You don't want to miss it. Um, if you have questions, go to the journeychurchdfw.com under the frequently asked questions. I can give you a lot of information. Please register for the service that you plan to attend, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday morning. And as it should be obvious, but I'm going to say, say it anyways. If you're not feeling well, stay home, okay? All right, so I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 22. Uh, my name is Jeff Strickland. I'm the lead pastor here at Journey Church, and welcome to Journey Church Online. Now, I Today is part of the weekend of Memorial Day weekend, and like Mother's Day and like Easter, it's not exactly like it normally is. It's not typical, is it? Easter and even Mother's Day, this is not shelter in place like what it was, but we are having to maintain a lot of physical distancing during this time. So it's strange at best. For most people, this weekend is kind of the unofficial start of summer. You know, it's about having the day off and hot dogs and burgers on the grill and swimming and family. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, please understand that is not the main thrust of the day. In fact, it's not even about honoring those who have served in armed forces. Though we're incredibly grateful, that's what Veterans Day is about. This is about honoring those who paid the ultimate price for the freedoms that we have today and we honor their families. So for those of you that have, your family member has given the price, they're giving their lives so we can live the lives that we lead, we say thank you and we honor you today.
Anytime we do a holiday time like this, I like to look and see a little bit of the history behind it. And the official birthplace, if you will, of, of Memorial Day was actually Waterloo, New York. Okay, And it was there on May 5th, 1866. General John Murray and General John A. Logan called on all communities to honor the war dead every year. As a matter of fact, General Logan had been so impressed with what he'd seen in the South and how they had honored Confederate soldiers that he wanted to change it. So in 1868, he's the head of a veterans group at this point, the Grand Army of the Republic. He says a big, huge proclamation called Decoration Day that would be observed nationwide. It was chosen to be May 30th. The reason it was chosen to be May 30th is this. There was no specific anniversary of a battle that day. But there were a lot of southern communities that didn't want to honor Decoration Day because of some lingering resentment and things from the Civil War. So a couple of ladies from Columbus, Missouri, or Mississippi, and I love this story, in 1866, they went to Friendship Cemetery, which in the outskirts of the city it was the battleground of the Shiloh Battle. And they lay flowers on both Union and Confederate soldiers both. The New York Tribune printed a big story about the unprejudiced acts of these women to, to lead wide, to, uh, to really love on and honor these people. And it led to widespread interest in impartial offerings on both sides in memory of the dead. And it was, it was thought that year to be a healing touch for the nation. And I tell you that part because I think our nation needs a healing touch today, and I think the church can be that. We're at a place where we can give that, that healing touch in a lot of lives. The alternate name Memorial Day, it didn't really start commonly being used until World War II, and it wasn't until 1967 that federal law recognized it as a holiday. So today's a day that we honor. Today's a day that we remember. Because the men and women that fought and laid down their lives, they are foundational stones of this great nation. And they give us the freedoms that we have today. So we remember them. And I want you to understand that remembering is biblical. It absolutely is biblical. You, you look back in the Old Testament, every time they met with God, every time something significant happened, they built an altar there to worship. But then the scripture says it would be left there for generations to come to tell of the goodness of God. So all through the Old Testament, we see remembering. Every Sunday, two weeks from today, when we do, when we do communion, when we partake of communion, we're remembering. We're remembering the Lord's sacrifice. We're remembering the Lord's, the Last Supper. We're remembering the Lord's word. So we remember then and we remember now. Now, Scripture gives a really good example of another remembering, a foundation stone, if you will. And it's found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. And I want to read this to you real quick. Don't cheat your neighbor by moving the ancient boundary stone markers, I mean, the ancient boundary markers set up by previous generations. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what everything that you're, for all that you're doing in our lives. I thank you for how you're moving. I thank you for how you're touching. I thank you for the work that you're doing, God, that we can't even begin to see. I pray, God, for the next few minutes that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, God, or arrest our, our thoughts. Let us hear from you today, Lord. I pray that we would be a little bit different after meeting with you this morning. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. I think this is actually a really interesting verse. And for a lot of you, if you're not careful, you'll kind of gloss over it while you're reading it. See, one of the temptations with Proverbs is, because they're little short pithy, short statements of, of, of wisdom, of education, what happens is we can kind of gloss over them because you'll see, don't move an ancient boundary stone, okay, whatever, and move on. You don't think about what that really, really means. But it's a huge piece, and I want you to understand it today. When Israel was settled, the land, the land itself, belonged to God, and it still does. And so what happened was the Israelites were just, they were tenants. And so according to the book of Joshua, the Lord apportioned the land to the different tribes, from there to the clans and then to different families. It was the Lord's to apportion, and he gave that as a blessing to people. Now here's the thing, and I want you to understand this. To Israel, to steal someone's property, because if you move the boundary, you're stealing property for them. To do so, you're rejecting God's lordship. That's why they looked at it. Why? Because it was God's right to use the land as he wished. So in, in an agricultural society, it's even more because a family's livelihood depended on their ability to farm the land and to take a portion of an acre and even an, an acre could absolutely been, be disastrous. So it's absolutely forbidden in Mesopotamian law as well as Jewish law to change those markers. As a matter of fact, according to the law, it brought a curse. All right, understand this. It, according to the covenant, it even brought a curse, and that's echoed all the way through the prophet Hosea. So it's not one little verse. It's all through the Old Testament. 
Now, the way that they would break land up would be a lot of ways. They would use different property breaks. They would use rivers and hedges, fences. But most often, they used permanent markers. They used, and they were typically stones to define the line. So to move the stone, you move the property line. What you're doing is you're trying to add to yours and you're taking from your neighbors. And we can't do that. That would be sin. So understand that the way it was all set up was deeply personal and, and would be incredibly insulting to move one of those and change one of those on top of being sin. Now, you can say, wow, that's great. What does that mean to me? What does it mean in 2020? What does it mean for the way I live? What does it look like in my world? How does that impact me? Let me ask you something. What do you think 10 years from now history books will say about the way our culture and our world handled the COVID-19 crisis of 2020? What will, what will college lecture halls and seminaries that are teaching on how the church led, what will they say 50 years from now, 100 years from now, on the way we handled this crisis? Now, I realize that there are people on, on both sides of the proverbial fence here. I understand that. And some of you say, dude, it is nothing more than this crazy, huge government ho- uh, conspiracy and hoax to try and, and get control of things and da 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 And I, maybe, I don't know. Some of you will say, man, it is nothing but political because the Democrats or the Republicans or the Libertarians or the Green Party or whatever did this and that. And some of you will say, you don't understand. My grandmother died of COVID-19 or it's plague 2.0. There are, people are all over the place. And I know that there are some very real, intense positions on this. But no matter where you fall on this issue, and hear me carefully, whether you realize it or not, you have established boundary markers during this time. You have established some things in your life. Here's what I mean by that. There are things that you have started doing, and there are things that you have stopped doing as a result of this time. And now there are new foundation stones laid for the new norm. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say things like this. Man, I can't wait till things get back to normal. And can I tell you, I don't think they're going to. Not normal like we always knew it. It's not going to happen. There are too many things that have changed. We're having to do church differently. We're going to have to live differently. We're doing things differently. So instead of saying get back to normal, let's start understanding that there is going to be a new norm. We're going to be doing church online from now on as well as church in the building. There are a lot of pieces that are going to be changing that we've just, we're going to have to follow that. So as as we're understanding and defining what that new norm looks like, the very things that you've done over these last three months are the foundation stones of your new norm. Don't move one. You know, I, I asked, I asked on my Facebook page, my personal page, what have you learned during this time? What are some things that you've started and what are some things that you've stopped that you're like, man, this has been really good. I'm going to keep that going. Now, Facebook is not the place for theology. I hope you're not getting your theology there. But it is a great place to kind of get a feel for where people are on things. And so I asked that question, where, what have you learned? And you guys did not disappoint. The time of me writing this message was just maybe a half day or later after I posted that. And I had 70 plus comments and I've had more come in since. And you guys did not disappoint. The majority of responses were things like this. More time with family, family meals and games, a simpler life, reducing the need for sports and entertainment, spiritual development, self-care, self-betterment, and honestly, perspective. All powerful things. I saw a couple people talk about money, and that's understandable because you have to have it to eat, right? And money's a big piece in a lot of people's worlds right now. There was a little bit on exercise. I saw a couple of people talk about doing church differently, and I saw a lot of thankfulness, and all those are great. But going back to the main pieces, I think there's some things that we could pull from that. Why? Because I find it interesting that even though, hear me, I do not, I do not, I do not believe that God brought COVID-19. Everybody understand that? I do not believe that this is from God, but I absolutely believe God can use it and is speaking through it. I think God is speaking to this this nation. I believe God is speaking to our church and churches all over America, and God is speaking to some families as well. I think God is talking to us about realigning some priorities and building some stones for our new normal because things are changing. I I saw in the news last night, all 50 states now have some some version of releasing some of these, these lockdowns. We're moving to develop our new normal. 
So understand, again, I do not believe that God brought COVID-19, but I think God's using it. I heard a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, make this statement. He said, God used COVID-19 to bring America's top four gods down. Self, money, sports, and entertainment. Inside of one week, all four were shut down. I believe God is speaking in so many areas. I believe God is challenging and he's wanting to develop the church. He's wanting to develop his people. I believe God is wanting to move inside of us and we're in a position that as he's speaking and hearing his voice, we can start to develop that new norm. You know, I don't want to go back to the old norm. I want to go back to what God is leading because God's fresh. He's new. He's moving. He's doing things. And you know what? At the foundation of time, God knew that COVID-19 would happen in 2020. And God can speak through that. He's challenging us. What are your foundation stones? What are you building this new norm on? I read a quote, and it's, it's actually, uh, I, I credited it originally to Brene, uh, Brene Brown, I believe. But the, the true author is going to be on the, the notes. But I want you to hear this quote. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, distraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We, are be, we have been given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and of nature. It's a powerful quote. Brene Brown, she shared it, but then... Uh, she, She gave the proper credit, and I want to make sure you see that in the notes. I want you to hear me this morning. God has given us an opportunity to stitch together a new garment. He's given us an opportunity to build a new foundation for our lives. We should not return to what was. We've set some boundary stones, and my challenge to you is with God's help and God's guidance, let's not move it. So for me, let me give you an example of what the boundary stones look like in my life. I have spent more time with my family in the last 12 weeks than I think I have in a long time, and I've loved it. I don't know that I have played the rest of my life as much in the last 12 weeks as as I have of horse, pig, around the world. My wife jumped in with my two boys, and we played two-on-two basketball. We've thrown the the, uh, football in the backyard. My son-in-law has jumped in, and we played some two-on-two, some different things like that. I've had some really quality time with my family. We've not eaten out as much. You know, we're eating out a couple times a week trying to support local business, but we're cooking and we're having dinner around the patio table, if it's cool, or the dinner table. We're spending time together. We're, we're intentional to talk, to laugh, to, to really eat together, to just simply be together. Glenda and I, we're, we're, we've got a great relationship. We had a great relationship going into COVID-19, but we, we're spending even more time together, TV and movies and talking and just spending time together, just the two of us. Our family, we've gone on walks. It's been absolutely beautiful. Now, one thing that's helped us is Glenda and I have both been able to work from home. We've afforded the church phones to the house. We, we both have laptops and internet. We've been able to work from home, and it's been, it's been good for us. But spending that time with family, I've always thought, one of the shows that Glenn and I watch, and I'm going to pull this idea, is we watch the show Blue Bloods. And I've always thought what they do is really cool. See, Blue Bloods is about a New York City family. that They're, new, they're cops. Tom Selleck is a police commissioner. They've got uh, Donnie Wahlberg. He's not Marky Mark, but, you know, he's a Wahlberg still. So they've got Donnie in there. And they've got all of these, you know, family together. And what happens is they go to church together on Sunday. And after church, they then go back to dad's house and they have a big family dinner together. And I've absolutely loved that. I've loved everything about that. And I'm going to be honest with you, I've not been as intentional about Sunday afternoon family lunches like I could be because of my job. We have to be intentional looking for times to protect different things. In other words, we all have things to do. What do we prioritize? See, I realize not everybody's had that privilege of working from home. And so you're trying to balance other things too. I, I, I do get that. But all of our lives, every one of our lives have changed dramatically. We've set the boundary stone. The challenge is not to let it change now. The fact is, we can allow the urgent to drown out the important. We can allow the urgent to drown out the important. Sometimes that, that pressing call comes in and you, you feel the urgency of it, but the importance of what you really need to be on, that's the thing. But you'll, you'll give your attention to the urgent instead of prioritizing the important. 
The challenge is keep the priorities where they need to be. Don't move a boundary stone. Things will always press. Don't let them press things out. Don't let it happen. Set your priority. And I really, truly believe this. And hear me, hear me well. These last 12 plus weeks, because here's the thing. When we are back in the building next Sunday, that'll be the first time in 12 weeks that we've been in the building together. 12 weeks. During that time, I know people have lost jobs. I know people have lost a lot of things. And people, there's been sickness and those types of things. And I'm certainly not downplaying that, but hear me. For a lot of us, what we've had is we've had a time that's allowed us to refocus. It's been a Shabbat. It's been a period of Sabbath, a time of rest. It's been a time to allow us to start to find our new rhythms, to develop the foundation stones for our new norm. I read a story when I was preparing for this message about a New York family that bought a Chinese bowl that they found at a garage sale for $3 in 2007. Now, you know that a $3 garage sale item is not going to make a good story, so get ready. It's going to be good stuff here. They held on to it from 2007. They spent $3 on it, and in 2013, so six years, it sat on a mantle. Six years, it probably held, I, I don't know. In my house, there are all kinds of weird things that end up in bowls, so I, don't, I can't even imagine. But in April of 2013, they found out that this bowl was worth a lot of money because this particular bowl was part of the North Song dynasty of, in China. It was more than 1,000 years old. Until someone told them what they had, this bowl just sat on the shelf. It just sat on the mantle. They were completely unaware of the value of this bowl. They found out it was valuable. So what do they do? They take it, what we would do, they take it to Sotheby's. I'm going to auction that rascal. We're going to make some money. When they take it in, it was expected to auction for $200,000. A $200,000 return on a $3 purchase. I'm not a financial advisor, but that's a pretty good return on investment. That's 199,997% return on investment. If you can get that kind of return on things, you're doing really, really, really well. Turns out a London dealer actually bought it for $2 million. It was a 66 million plus percent return on that initial investment. Why? Because somebody realized the value. They didn't realize how precious it was. They didn't realize how valuable it was until it was pointed out to them and and, and it showed them what that looked like. So God's speaking. He's speaking to us now. He's showing us over these last three months. He's showing us what's really important, what's really precious and what's really valuable. So what are your boundary stones? What boundary stones do you have that are important? Decide in your heart. Decide in your heart now what's going to be important and start to prioritize it. The men and women who fought and they died for this nation, they're precious. They're foundational. Let this time be that for you as well. Realize the value of what you've had and set that stone. Set it today. The prophet Habakkuk tells us this. He says, write the vision and make it plain to see. Maybe you should take a minute and sit down with your spouse or if you're by yourself. If you have kids, sit down with your kids. But here's the thing, mom, dad, if your kids are going to be with you, you drive that. Drive it and say, what are the things that we as a family have seen? What are the things that we've seen during this time that are so important, that are so valuable? What do we want to protect? And then challenge. Follow Habakkuk's example and write it out. Write it out so you can see it and put it up somewhere to where you know what it is. Write it out and make it plain to see. This whole weekend is about something precious and about sacrifice. And Jesus, he saw us as precious and he made the ultimate sacrifice. See, We were born with sin in our lives. We were born separated from the will of God. We were born with things that kept us from being what God wanted us to be. And Jesus laid his life down so that we could be reunited with the Father because we're precious. He laid the ultimate foundation stone, the foundation stone for us to know an eternity in heaven. So right now as you're watching this stream, you may feel a little bit of a nudge. You may feel something in your stomach, just something kind of kind of gnawing at you a little bit. That's the Lord. That's the Lord saying, hey, I love you. Come to know me. Enter into a relationship with me. Maybe you had a relationship with Jesus a long time ago and you walked away, or maybe you've never had one. Today's the day. 
Today is the day. This would be the greatest foundation stone you could put in your life would be the day that you started living a life that followed Jesus. Are you going to be perfect at it? Goodness gracious, no, I'm not. But we can keep trying and we can keep growing and we can keep pressing in. So if you're, wherever you're sitting right now, if you're in your car, your living room, wherever it may be, as you start to feel that, that nudge, you're like, man, that's Jesus. Here's my chance. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sin. Lord, right now, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I know you are alive and well today. I give you my life. I give you everything I am. I lay it at your feet. Be my God, and I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something. Right now in this house, if we had a house full of people, we'd be going crazy. Why? Because at Journey Church, we don't just preach for information. We preach for transformation. And the fact is, heaven is going crazy right now for you. And we would be as well. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If that's you, if you just prayed that prayer in the comments, there's a link there that says you just prayed a prayer. Click on that. It'll connect you to one of our pastors. And we'll reach out to you. And we'll start walking you through what these pieces look like. Now, I'm going to pray for everybody else in the house right now, everybody watching the stream, because we have got to move, as we move forward, and different things start to open up. We're at 50% in restaurants now, and everything's starting to open and move that direction. Here's the challenge, because life starts to really press down on us. We've got to set the stones and make them priority. So I want to pray over that. Father, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you that you are speaking into our hearts and lives. God, I thank you that you have challenged us, God, to set a priority. Lord, I pray that you would enable every person watching the screen, every person that's hearing these words, God, let them walk this out. Lord, I pray that we'd be intentional to create the, the priorities, the, the stones that we have laid to build this new, this new norm. Lord, let us be intentional to protect that, Father. Let us build those things up and make those priority, that family time that time with you, whatever that might look like, let us be intentional to prioritize those stones. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. I want to say to you real quick, if you're newer to Journey Church, there's a, also a link in the comment bar. You can click on that saying, hey, I'd like to connect with Journey Church. We'll send you some information. We would love to have that opportunity to connect with you. If you'd like to worship in the area of your giving, there's also a link to where you can give at journeychurchdfw.com. Opportunity to, get, to give and worship in that area as well. If we could pray with you in any way, give us the opportunity. We would love to do that. Again, there's another link. There's quite a few links there. If there's another link there, click on that. Give us the opportunity. We would love to simply pray with you. I want to speak something over you on Memorial Day weekend knowing that this coming Wednesday night, we have a real special Facebook Live, 7 o'clock. Pastor Jason and I, join us. Even if you don't normally do Facebook, jump on that one with us, 7 o'clock on the Journey Public page. But I believe the Lord is speaking in a pretty significant way, and I want to speak this over you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We speak blessings upon you. You're the head, you are not the tail, you're above and you are not beneath. Thank you for joining us for this time today. We'll see you soon. God bless you.